On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we try Glenfiddich 15. What are you, what are you doing? No, we gotta share! Mom! Mom! Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky. This is Eric. Victorian England had a huge influence on the fashions and styles that were happening in Highland dress in Scotland. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world and it is your personal heritage story. Howdy boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky. That's Eric. You. Today, two special treats. First special treat is we have a special person in the MC chair. Very special lady, Miss Emma. Uh, and Patrick's supposed to pull her in down there. There she is. There she is. Hi. Hey, everyone. Hi, Emma. How you doing? Da, da, I'm doing da, great. Da, da. Lovely. Um, our other special treat. I'm sad you don't do the foot thing anymore. I know. Well, I, I dropped the thing off like twice now. Okay. Um, we are drinking the Glenfiddich 15 given to us by Chris McFate. Um, so... I'm actually very, very anxious to get into this one. I'm a, I'm a fan of Glenfiddich, mm -hmm. and I don't think I've ever had yep. the 15. We haven't. Yes. We have the 12, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, Emma, while I'm pouring these out, why don't yes. you uh, tell us what to expect? Okay. Glenfiddich 15-year-old Solera Reserve single malt scotch whiskey is created using uh, a technique pioneered by our, our malt mastered and its warm, spicy flavors are transformed with the alchemy of the Solera vat. Alchemy. Yes. Alchemy. Alchemy. Our Solera 15 is aged in European oak sherry casks and new oak casks. The whiskey is mellowed in our unique Solera vat, a large oak tun inspired by the sherry. Now, this word looks like bodegas to me of Spain <laughs> and is Portugal. Bodegas. Uh, never emptied and kept half full of whiskeys since 1998, which means this whiskey is a little bit older than I am. Interesting. Um, yeah. So uh, on, let me grab my. So yeah. it's like a liquid crib sheet. Indeed, indeed. Make sure you kick all the electronics back there. Yep. All right. And while you are coming back to collect, what are you wearing today? Uh, I have on my Buchanan muted maxi kilt. Ooh, yeah. very mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. With salamander. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Rocky, hmm. what are you wearing today? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Yeah, yeah. I am wearing the Nordic Heritage Tartan, mm -hmm. which you can't see behind this little desk thing. Yeah, right I think there. we got the order mixed up yeah. somehow, but that's okay. And what are you wearing, my friend? I am wearing Scott Green Weathered. Beautiful tartan. It's funny because it doesn't look green at all, but you know, that's what it is. That's what it's called. That's, that's what the, it is. This is, one of my, this is my favorite woodland tartan, actually. This is one I like to wear out in the woods. Yes, indeed. Yep. Cool. All right. So, Emma, what can we expect on the nose? The nose, yes. An intriguingly complex mm. aroma. Sweet heather honey and vanilla fudge combined with rich, dark fruits. I smell the fruits. Definitely getting the fruits. I don't know about this. I don't know about this fudge jazz. I get a little bit of the vanilla, maybe. I kind of get the vanilla, but it's like vanilla to caramel. Yeah. It's in there and it's in the middle there, you know what I mean? Okay. All right. What do we have on the on the palate? On the palate, yeah. So silky smooth, revealing layers of sherry oak, marzipan, cinnamon, and ginger. Full body bodied and bursting with flavor. Oh, I got some up my nose. Oh, that burns. I feel like my mouth is bursting. It's like Starburst, but in whiskey form. Oh, <clears throat> I swallowed it and then like hiccuped or breathed or something and it went up my nose, like up the back of uh -huh. the throat. Yeah. Professional. That's, oh. The, um. Don't snort your whiskey, kids. Inside or outside. It's sweet. It's very mild. Um, tiny, 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 tiny bit of pepper on the sides yeah. of my mouth. Yeah. Um, not. Is that just normal alcohol burn or is that pepper? I think it's more about more alcohol burn, but Emma, what are you getting there? No, it's, um, it's a little bit peppery on the end. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that is alcohol for sure. <laughs> um, first time I forgot to taste it. Uh, yeah, I I think um, maybe maybe the cinnamon ginger I can pick up. I am not a big uh, whiskey drinker. Okay. Um, Gave it a touch or two of water there, mm -hmm. or a drop or two. 
I think I overwatered it, but making a whiskey cocktail. Not intentionally. Yeah. Oh. The water cut out all the pepper, all the alcohol burn, Ooh. gone. Yeah. I'm getting more. Pour a touch of water in it. <laughs> yeah. I think some peatiness came out with the water actually. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. You too. Yeah. Okay. A little that 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 dirt kind of roughness on the tongue mm -hmm. kind of thing. Okay. A little bit of the old iodine. I'm going to start whisking. I'm going to call it old iodine. Like a real, real subtle on the iodine. The peat, yes. The iodine, tiny, mm. tiny, tiny little bit. It's pronounced iodine. It's Irish. Sorry, Mom. The uh, not enough to scare anybody off. If you're if you're not a fan of like an Isla, it's it's not enough to. Mm -hmm. It's not going to kick you. Um, no, not at all. Yeah, not bad. It's not bad. I'm not amazed by it. Yeah, I would want more out of it, but I wouldn't. But it's not bad. Mm -hmm. Like, if this was a twelve, um, or something like you know, it would be a very good twelve and okay fifteen. I'll mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, all right, Emma. Yeah. Give me a score, one to ten. Don't be afraid of the decimal. Right. Get in Decimals. there. Yep. Um, uh, Two or below is like, hell no, wouldn't drink it. I'd refuse it. Eight or above is I would drive somewhere to go get it. I love it that much. All right. Yeah. Um, we'll say a 5.5. .5. I don't mind the finish on it, actually. Um, but yeah, okay. not not my cup of tea necessarily. Fair. It's mm. not tea, it's whiskey. But that's true. Yeah. That's why I'm confused. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're like, this doesn't taste like tea. <laughs> It would make for one hell of a tea, that's for sure. Um, six point four. Okay, okay. You gonna justify that or just leave it there? It'll probably grow on me in the course of the evening. Um, I like it. It's not it's not particularly stunning in any particular way, but I did. I thought the nose was really good when we first poured. I thought the, the 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 fruitiness of the nose definitely came through for me, and and more of a the vanilla slash caramel note is definitely there, which I like. So it's Come. good. Come. It's not knocking my socks off, but it's good. Come. Um, I'm gonna go seven point one. It's it's good. It's not yeah spectacular. Not over the moon. I'm not factoring in price with this. I'm just saying. Based on the flavor of it, based on the quality of it, seven yeah. one. So, okay, cool. There, there you go. go. That's our review and of the Glenfiddich fifteen. And thank you again to Chris McFate. Thank you, Chris. Cheers. All right. So, Eric, why don't you start us off with a question? Hey, Eric, why don't you start us off with a question? Since we're not behind at all, I can do that. Now we have to do the show extra fast now because we lost some time. So we're going to do everything as a speed run, right? Stop one Ram second. Fuzzy. Mm. That was the off button. Yep. Okay. Uh, Fran McGregory asked us. So she 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 she's seen what's been she's been keeping up with current events. Why did you make an Appalachian tartan or Appalachian? It's beautiful, but I'm curious about the history and the idea behind it. That's a great question. That is a perfect question for today. Yes, as indeed. it happens. So, bit of housekeeping. We did we as in Emma and Jillian did a tartan called the Appalachian Folklore Tartan. Um, it's on our website right now, limited edition. Um, it's We're doing pre-orders now through what, end of November, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Emma, why don't you give us a little bit of your inspiration? What what, what spoke to you? Yeah. Um, so I've always been a lover of the Appalachian uh, mountain range. It uh, is, I'm, I'm a big fan of the nature and the culture. It's where my family vacationed every year. We'd go all the way down. Dollywood is a big draw for my family. Uh, we'd hmm. spend a lot of time there. Um, so I, uh, in talking with Jillian, um, I, I wanted to I'm kind of bouncing ideas off of her about like creating a tartan that's really natural, some greens and browns, which you don't always see in a lot of tartans, um, in represented and uh, kind of linking in the nature and the folklore of Appalachia. I'm a big Mothman person, um, so we wanted to draw in a little bit of that. Um, and then she had this idea of like these two red eyes peeking out at you at the darkness. And I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, why don't you uh, 
help design the tartan and she was fantastic about it. We wanted greens, we wanted browns uh, and she linked up with that. But um, the history of the region is really exciting to me, uh, kind of digging into it uh, during the design process. Uh, the Scots Irish people that uh, are really integral to Appalachian culture. Mm -hmm. um, and then, even on the natural side, when we look at uh, the natural history and how the Appalachian Range were once part of the Caledonian Range in Scotland, I thought that was a really neat connection. Geologically, it's, the, it's almost the same. You're kind of walking uh, in the traces of your ancestors, uh, just separated through um, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. Um, millions of years yeah millions millions yeah. of years yeah um but yeah so i uh, kind of mixed that all together came up with this beautiful tartan um it's nice. been exciting yeah excellent yeah so that's how it came to be and then they showed it to me and then they said like hey here's a thing and i was like, no no they didn't show it to me um you said you gotta go downstairs and look at this tartan like they're designing a tartan down there and i'm like oh wait what nope nope i went downstairs and i was just like Damn, it's actually really, really good. We got to do something with this. So, yeah. Can we throw it up on Still Store Cambot? There yes. we go. Ooh. So that is the Appalachian Folklore Pretty. Tartan. As per Jillian and Emma, Tartan Designers Extraordinaire. Yes. Let mm -hmm. me know what you think about it. I love hearing from you guys. And the email at sales at usakilts.com or on Facebook. Super yeah. awesome. I have a friend who is a uh, self-professed, very proud Appalachian hailbilly, and he <laughs> thinks it's the freaking bomb. Awesome. So he's trying to get his, his whole family to go in on it. So Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's what's yeah. really been exciting is having people who are Appalachian reach out and, and feel so represented. And there was one comment where it was like, I live in the Appalachians right now, and I'm looking out my window, and the scenery is as beautiful as this tartan is. And I was like, wow, that's really sweet and yeah. exciting that it's doing yeah. its job. Very cool. Yes. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Kinfolk even reached out, uh, a, a band from the Appalachian region. Yep. Um, so yep. they're they were excited about it as well. They're yep. if you guys don't know who Kinfolk is, go check out Kinfolk. K I N N F O L K. Two N's. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> very 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 talented musicians. Um, but yep. yeah, it seems to mean a lot to the people from the region, and that's really what is we're trying to do. I'd say it's probably one of the most contemporary designs we've ever done, and yet it's also it's very wearable. Yeah, you know it's very mellow, so I think it's gonna it's a good one, if I do say so ourselves. Yeah, it would it would make a I'll I'll put it this way it would make contemporary insofar to my mind, it would make a good kilt or a good flannel shirt, like it's got a good you know mass kind of appeal to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm mm -hmm. excited for the great kilt orders that keep going coming. Yeah, in. it is a fantastic great kilt tartan. Yeah. Um. So if you're thinking about getting a great kilt, check out our tartan. Uh, yeah. yeah. I love how you threw up your gang sign there, too. That's right. Yeah. They do that in Appalachians. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Appalachian gang sign. <laughs> they abound. Yeah. Cool. All right, Emma, do we have anyone from the audience? Um, got a question from Kat um, asking, nerdy kilt accessories. I mean, some for more uh, patches, battle kilt, that kind of thing. Pins. Nerdy accessories. kilt accessories. Battle kilt. Battle kilt. <sighs> battle kilt. Battle kilt. I remember Isn't that, that what phrase from. Rose on, wrote on battle kilt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Cringer, my fearsome friend. Yes. Um, battle kilt. That was a. There was a myth we dispelled about the battle kilt years ago. Yeah. I think that there was such a thing as a battle kilt, but I'm not sure what they mean by nerdy. I mean. Um. They want, they're hoping for something, ways to do the nerd, like ways to dress up a kilt for a con maybe. Does that make sense? Potentially, yeah. I okay. was thinking maybe along the lines, I know downstairs everyone has their own little kilt pins that may not yeah. be traditional that they put in there. I think um, that's I think that's the key answer is that basically um, a kilt, your tartan can mean a whole lot of different things to you or it can just be that you like the color. As we've said many times, if you're going to add personality to an outfit, we often say the best way to start is with the kill pin. Kill pin. So, uh, yeah, we, as, as Emma pointed out, we have a lot of people who will use a kill pin or something as a kill pin in order to express some fandom or something. I've seen, you know, enamel pins from an anime series. I've seen Jillian has a really cool Star Trek Mirror Universe uh, Earth Empire pin. 
Um, I've occasionally worn a Klingon pin. Um, you know, we have we've I've seen guys who do like the Mandalorian sim, you know, clan symbol as a as a kilt pin. So that's the way to start. Um, you know, just for fun, so you get that that little like, oh, I know that. You know, we're we're, we're fans of the same thing. Um, but nerd is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. You know? The 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 kilt pin in in my mind is the the easiest. It's just a piece of jewelry on your kilt. A little bit of bling on the front of you. That is a great place for personal expression that doesn't you know fight with the heritage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great option. You know, a, any kind of fandom type thing, or if you're gonna you have an old brooch that was your grandmother's that you really want to honor her, or like Sean Smith has a you know a, a feather kilt pins that he just got recently. Yeah. So that's that's where you can play with it a little bit and still look traditional. So I think that's a good good thought. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think basically um I would think about how you want the outfit to look as a whole first and worry about the nerd part after. You know what I mean? It's basically make sure you look great uh, for whatever you're going to, regardless of any, you know, special in-crowd dog whistly, you know, fandom type accessories, and then add those in. I mean, we have seen people who have done like full kilted cosplay things like a, there's kilted Star Wars guys out there, as I'm sure most of you know. But I'd say the bottom line is to imagine your kilt as part of your wardrobe first just like you would anything else, and then add in your personality on top as, as a layer. Um, there are tartans that people will choose for fandoms or nerdy aspects. I mean, there are certain colors and stuff that lend themselves to uh, different fandoms um, on top of whatever other meaning you want to use. But yeah, just the bottom line is have fun with it and uh, take context into account, as we always say. Yep. Y'all. All right, next question. Sure. All right, I'm gonna do uh, one from one of them women folk here. Um, Sue Becker asked us, are there rules, quote unquote, or recommendations on footwear for ladies when kilted in a formal or semi-formal outfit? Or event context, I would say. So, shoes. Oh my God, shoes. Oh my God, shoes. I would say it, it starts with, it depends on the context. So is it formal? Is it semi-formal? Is it casual? And go from there. So we'll, we'll bring in Emma for this one. The, uh, what would you wear to a formal or semi-formal type event? Right, yeah. Um, so kilted at a formal event, I think for the most part, if it's a very, very formal event, I would probably lean more towards wearing a gown with a sash over top. And in a very formal, I'm pretty much only in heels. If you have issues with heels, flats would totally be okay too. Uh, but I'm leaning more towards heels, pumps for a formal or semi-formal event. Um, if, if we get a little bit less formal, um, I, I do like a, a good boot uh, for day wear, um, clogs, uh, I'll wear platforms, a small platform around here, I like a little bit of extra height. Um, but yeah, so I think there's a lot of different things you can do. I always try to match my leathers in my shoes if, if I'm mm. going for something along those lines. Um, but, uh, so yeah, formal, I would say heels, semi-formal, I would say heels or a flat, something along those lines. So are you including like cocktail hour kind of events in the semi-formal yeah. category? Yeah. Like where you'd have a kilted skirt or a maxi kilt or something? Yeah. For a cocktail event, I would definitely, uh, wear a kilted skirt, maybe a sash with it, a uh, maxi kilt. Um, in, uh, the six outfit video, I wore a cocktail level outfit. I had a pair of uh, black heels on with that, uh, okay. to kind of step it up a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it, it, this is oversimplification, but it sounds like the, the goal is a comfort depending on the event, you know, if you're mm -hmm. not comfortable in heels, don't wear heels. Um, but like we, we say for the gents also, um, I'm don't, uh, don't let the shoes override the outfit, mm. I guess. Right. Yeah, you've got your beautiful tartan on. Uh, yeah. Definitely don't uh, pair it with some crazy kind of shoes, unless that's what you like to do, by all means. But mm -hmm. uh, I would kind of make a cohesive outfit, um, kind of keep, keep everything in mind when you're selecting the heels or platforms or whatever if you want to go with it. What Makes would sense. you think of, my thought is, uh, if it were me, I would make the tartan kind of the centerpiece and the shoes, you know, 
minimalist, not have something you know, super loud over the top because I want the tartan to really be the thing that kind of stands out and speaks to people. Or if I'm wearing a tartan gown, tartan ball gown kind of thing and tartan silk or something like that, yeah. then I wouldn't want to have everything compete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think I'd probably lean a little bit more towards a black heel or a white beige heel. Or if, if you like color a lot, maybe try and find a heel that pulls out a color in your tartan. Uh, so it's not like these crazy colored shoes that you have on that are taking away with it. But yeah, you've got a, a beautiful kind of standout outfit. Um, don't let the shoes take away from the whole uh, effect of it. Yeah. That's But that's a good point because we're always telling guys to, um, uh, you know, have the flashes or your necktie kind of pick up a color that's one of the colors in the tartan. So yeah. you could theoretically do matching shoes that tone well. Yeah. with an accent color or a chosen color in the tartan. Yeah, I would think yeah. so. In in women's shoes, I think you have a little bit more color variation. There's mm -hmm. a, a little bit more going mm -hmm. on there. So that's more of an option. It's not just the charcoal, black, brown leather that you get mm -hmm. uh, with men. So if you can find it, but keep it in mind when you're out shopping, know that you have this uh, event that you're coming up. You want to wear your tartan sash with your ball gown or something along those lines. You want to tie it together. Um, so, yeah. And that reminds me of a shopping tip also that we um, – I'm not sure about other manufacturers, but we always send scrap fabric from a kilt, if it's a wool kilt, to the customer um, for reference or if for, there's anything or for left, projects. Yeah. So if there's anything left. So taking a swatch of fabric of the kilt with you when you go shopping for the accessories, this might be another instance where that makes a lot of sense. You can actually see, you know, these are beautiful red shoes, but is it the right red? Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I definitely hmm. do that when I go thrifting. I have uh, little swatches that I keep in my pocket, actually. Really? Yeah, okay. yeah, I do it. I practice it. Because after spending so much money on clothes that I get home and I try on with my kilt, and I'm like, oh, man. It's not quite the right color. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Um, so it's worth it for me. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. Okay. Cool. Hope that helps. Nice. All right, Emma, who else do we have on the, the interwebs out there? Yeah, um, let's see here. Um, so from Wyatt Harper, I've never received any traditions growing up, but now I'm trying to start traditions that link to my Scottish heritage. Do you have any suggestions? Start traditions. Like activities or, hmm. The, I can think of a couple of ways to think about this, but you go ahead. Yeah. Um, if you're, let's assume he's starting a family or, it's, yeah. you know, it's, you know, when you're, when you start a family, you start thinking about your mortality, you start thinking about passing things on, you start thinking about all that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say find, uh, find your tribe, kind of start there. So either find a clan society or find a Highland Games or find like-minded people who, you know, want to go out and, you know, wear kilts and start with that. It'll, you know, having a communal effort and a community to kind of call upon or to join up with or to you know celebrate with is a great way to start a tradition. So if you're, you know, you're in an area where there's a Highland Games every single summer on the third weekend of September, um, <laughs> then great. Start, you know, going there every single year. Make it a tradition. Make it a plan to go there every year. Try to, you know, talk to people while you're there, you know, meet other people who have similar interests to you and then you get to meet up with them every year so it's that's kind of where i would go with it to start yeah um i would say that whether it's there's there's different two different levels to think about this maybe even three uh one would be as an individual um you know expressing yourself in your style or things that you expose yourself to like what you read what kind of music you listen to what kind of research you do for whatever cultural stuff um, hobbies you get into, like, you know, in my case, I know a lot of people who, because of the Nordic thing, get into brewing mead. Um, there's an individual approach, but then there's also a family approach where you're trying to, um, share an experience with people who are close to you, either blood family or found family. Um, and in either case, but especially with the latter, it comes down to forming a habit. So think about the calendar would be my advice. Basically, um, how much of a big deal do you make out of New Year's? Maybe you want to have a Hogmanay party or start simple and make sure that like you you try to watch the fireworks from Edinburgh Castle with your with your kids, you know, little things like that. Let them stay up for that special thing to see the fireworks from Scotland. Um, think about um, other things you do around the holidays is the easiest way to start, honestly. 
um, that you can in, incorporate into them. Do burns night, you know. Uh, start introducing foods to your family that they might want to try. You know, make neeps and tatties. You know, try getting some haggis for a special occasion. Ha- hell, have have haggis with your turkey for Thanksgiving. Um, well, breakfast haggis is... Yeah, find bedtime stories. But the trick is to make it consistent because you're not going to form a lasting impression with especially younger people if it's not something that they can look forward to. Um, when my family got into heathenry, there were a lot of things that we did um, that were the European twists on what you know people normally do for Christmas that we incorporated in order to give the kids a sense of making this occasion their own and it being a really important part of who they are and where they come from. And it, I, I can say now it worked. I mean, my daughter has fond memories, you know, and she's like 20 now of doing things when she was six um, that really stuck with her. Uh, I have a friend who is uh, Swedish and he does, they do the uh, St. Lucia thing every year. Nobody around them does it, but you know, they, 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 they go to the St. Lucia service and his daughter actually does the crown and everything and, and does that tradition. So find things that they can incorporate on a regular calendrical basis so that you remember to do it and, and then it'll work. And it's just, it's really about forming habits. I'm rambling, but the bottom line is it's about forming a habit if you want it to really stick. Yeah. And also um, to, to make sure it sticks, to make sure you form the habit, get them involved in the process, mm-hmm. not just the end result. Absolutely. Don't host a Burns dinner and do all the stuff yourself and then have them come to the Burns dinner or, you know, sit down for dinner and, you know, here's your food. It's make them, er, allow them the opportunity, <laughs> speaking as a father, to help yeah prepare the haggis or to help bring out the whiskey or to bring out the whatever, like don't drink the whiskey necessarily. It depends <laughs> on how old they are. Um, but you know, pipe in the haggis, let them carry it into the room. Sure. Let them Absolutely. prepare the neeps and tatties with you. Let them do the stuff with you so that it's not just the end result that they're enjoying. It's they're going to remember the whole process. Yeah. And that way in the next year, it's like, oh, they're going to bug you to do it and you're going to bug them to do it. It's Mm -hmm. kind of like going to the gym. If you are accountable to going to a gym with your friend, then you will go to the gym more often than if you have to go by yourself. So hold yourself accountable and hold them accountable in the same way that they can hold you accountable. Cultural accountability. I think that's that's exactly it. I mean, and again, on a a non-familial parental basis, like maybe you host a whiskey tasting once a month. You know? Yeah. Something as simple as that. And- and if you have other guys that you know, or girls that you know that drink whiskeys, great. Once a month, everybody goes out and buys a bottle or one, you know, it, two people, maybe it's like, like six of them is too much, but maybe, you know, one guy or two people buy a bottle and you try the different ones and then you hang out and, and you know, insert yeah. X activity here, but it's the drinking of the whiskey. It's the hanging out. It's sitting around the fire. It's telling old stories, old war stories, whatever. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. But the whiskey is the vehicle to get there. And that becomes part of the tradition is, okay, this week we're going to, this month we're going to try this. This month we're going to try that. Yeah. 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 I think that's it. It's just a try and find something that you can do as a routine, whether it's for yourself or for a group. And I think you'll have a great time. That's, it's a really good thought. I never yeah. thought about it that way. So, agreed. Yeah, cool. Cool. Thank you. Cheers. I like that. Yeah, I, like that I do lot. too. You have to use more of that stuff. Yeah, like I'm, I'm thinking about like our Halloween traditions are now. You know, uh, you know, we go out together. You know, me, Kelly, and Liam, and we pick out the pumpkins together. And we have an idea of what we want to carve mm-hmm. before we go, so we know what shape pumpkin to get. And then we have you know a small, medium, large for the family members. So we always get the. We never do that. Well, okay. no, but we each have We're our own designs, chaotic. and we all like, uh, okay. help each other do okay. it. And, you know, it's it's part of it's now just become a thing. And mm-hmm. I would as a as a holiday grouch for all of it. I would never decorate. I would never do anything. I think Christmas lights are pointless in the fact that you put them up and take them down like three weeks later. Um, I would never. I'm I am such an old curmudgeon in doing that because mm-hmm. I'm lazy, <laughs> but. It's become a family thing. And I am held accountable from my son and from my wife. And then, you know, I I had to remind them, hey, we hadn't carved the pumpkins yet. We only have two days till Halloween. Oh, shoot. Okay, we got to do that. So we're holding each other accountable. So it really does matter. And it really does keep it going when you're holding yourselves accountable. I think you want to make sure it doesn't become burdensome. That'd be the only, that'd be the only caveat is making sure that it doesn't, it's like, 
I hate doing this, you yeah. know? And then you don't find out until like you're there 20 years like, dad, we always, oh, we hated, always hated that. We yeah. always hated cutting our own tree for Christmas. We really hated it, you know, but. And it, the key to that is just don't set the bar too high. Exactly. You're not gonna have a seven course haggis meal that you have to prepare for a week in advance every single January 25th. Yeah. It's, you know, you set the bar low for, there's a couple little things that you do and that's an easy way to carry it through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stress, stress will kill a tradition or a love of heritage pretty yeah. quick. I just thought of another one. You could like uh, keep a keep a book of Burns poems or something, and just make a promise yourself to read one a night for a while or one a week, you know. Or if you're church, if you're a church going person, you can, uh, you know, find some some of your own old passages and and stuff from like um, you know the the Scottish theologians and stuff like that, and actually you know do something that's kind of spiritual as well as heritage related on a regular weekly basis. You know, there's there's a lot of ways you could do it. Yeah, if you are disciplined. Gotta stick with it. Indeed. All right. right. Sorry. No, cool. We no, were uh, again, off I, 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 I really like that question. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna bring down the mood though. All right. The Irish War Pipes said to us, Hey, could you all do a show on fake kilt shops on the internet? I was just contacted by somebody calling themselves USA Kilts, all caps asking me to purchase before the Halloween sale ends. I fear many people have lost money on these false front shops set up in India and Pakistan, especially since the names are so close. So we sadly do have some experience with this one. Yeah. Witness the fact that the example included our name. Yeah. Um, as a rule, we do not speak negatively about competitors. I'm making this much of an exception for... Uh, for people that rip others off. And I'm gonna kind of leave it with that. So uh, the one that he's talking about there is USA Kilt Z with a Z. There's another one called yeah. USA Kilt Shop, mm -hmm. not us. Um, I remember way, way back when, when we first started back in 2003, 2004, I remember getting emails from Pakistani companies and there was one called like Joffrey Kilts, who was, you know, essentially just using the name of Joffrey Taylors over in Scotland, you know, for their own. So there are, there are several less scrupulous companies um, who will trade on the names of other companies. Um, so morals in Highland wear, you know, there's, there's image theft is rampant. It happens, it's not great, but it happens. Um, IP theft, um, there's, you know, name theft where people use another company's name. <sighs> Ultimately, I, I, I make a personal plea to everyone out there. Um, and this is not just saying a blanket statement, all companies in Pakistan are bad. I'm not saying that. Um, what I'm saying is companies and individuals who rip off other hardworking companies, other shops, other, you know, it, it, who think that, you know, ah, it's, it's just quick, 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 just make a buck. Those are the ones, here's my plea, don't shop with them. You don't have to shop with us. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is don't shop with scumbags and thieves. So when you're out there, vet the company. Look around a little bit. Um, if, you, if you don't know, go to you know, different kilt groups on Facebook or different kilt communities and ask them, hey, I saw this company. Is this company associated with that company? Or you know, this image looks a lot like that guy's image. Or has everyone bought from this company before? Mm -hmm. What was your experience? Do some research to see what uh, what other people have experienced out there with these companies and find reputable companies. Um, again, it doesn't have to be us. This isn't the point. The point is don't buy from shysters, liars, thieves, scumbags who yeah. utilize, <laughs> I'm being harsh, but I don't care. Um, people who are trading on other companies' names and using other companies' images as their own. Because if they're not proud enough to build their own name or take pictures of their own products, what do you think you're gonna get? Yeah. I'm gonna guess it's not gonna be spectacular. Yeah, that's a good way. Good good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you kind of stole my thunder a little bit with the, th the one thing I was gonna tr Sorry. contribute is like, um, I always recommend I do this all the time. I vet companies with um, people I know. So I would say, yeah, definitely check out an online group or friends, um, Kilt and Culture or Brotherhood or one of the other Kilt groups out there and, you know, 
find out what people think of this company before you buy something from them. And if the deal seems too good to be true, it probably is. And uh, and yeah, I mean, I think trust your instinct. It's not that hard usually to tell um, when it's not a good thing, when it's actually something you're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. And I would also, and I would say, if you find one, if you run into one, like this gentleman did, tell people about it. You know, shut those people out. Get the word out that they are, they are no good, and and help protect your brothers from <clears throat> getting screwed over. Also, yeah. So, yeah. unfortunately, when it comes to USA Kilt Z with a Z or USA Kilt Shop, um, both of which not us, um, when we saw them first pop up, we actually went to Instagram and to Facebook and said like, "Hey, um, they're using our name, and they're using they were like in all of their descriptions. It was USA Kilts, you know, spelled properly." Um, and they, the the two main social media platforms took them down, but then they allowed them back in. And then we had a you know a bunch of customers kind of pointing yeah. about it, and you know they all you know reported them as spam, and you reported them as fake companies, and da 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 da. Um, and it, it's it's been an up down up down thing. They've been back up for a while, um, but it's it's just not cool. If you have a good idea, start your own thing, do your own thing. You don't need to glob on to someone else's yeah. thing. You don't need to steal other people's ideas, other people's images, other people's tartans, right. whatever it is, do your own. And it is it is playing whack-a-mole for sure, but it, it's a fight we have to engage in. It's just the state of the world. I, I feel especially sorry for um, really bespoke art. I mean, we do bespoke stuff, but um, sporn makers, knife makers, people like that, they, they, they have their images ripped off all the time too. Or Doug. Doug Cavanaugh from yep. Celtic Hammer Club, you know, who yep. had the nightmare of his most popular design becoming, <clears throat> you know, all over the freaking internet and being stolen by everybody, you know, and and not to steal thunder from the interview coming up, but you know, he actually found it used in a game, in a video game once, and had to contact like Bethesda to say, "Yo, Ubisoft, or you yeah. was it Ubisoft? Okay, Ubisoft." Um, but you get the point. Yep. Yep. So it's uh, we, we are all in this together. Yeah. One could say. It's, so. Yeah, it's it's the it's the stealing of stuff from artisans. The, the other one example that just popped in my mind was I remember Robert Pell from Arkilts mm -hmm. um, had a, a company in Pakistan send him images of his original design. It was like, hey, we can make this for you. You should buy your kilts from us. And he's like, no, I, I make my own kilts. That's my design. You know, don't do my design. And they were like, yeah, if you don't buy it from us, we're just going to sell it anyway. Um, and they started copying him or yeah. the... Uh, Who's yeah. the one that made the kilts in uh, Minnesota or whatever? Um, uh, Angry Bastard? No, 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 no. It was a woman-owned business. It was her and her partner. Oh, um, um, yeah, uh, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't Minnesota. Excuse me. It was. I know, it was Seattle. I remember who you're or, talking or about. Oregon. I can't remember her yeah, name. It was out west coast. Was um, it alt kilts? Yeah. No. No, it wasn't alt kilts. She was. Jeannie was great too. I loved Jeannie. She okay. since closed. Uh, but there was another company, and you know it's. It's it's companies that just go, ooh, that's a different image. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to copy that. And taking different companies' designs and just knocking it off. Yeah. It, just do something original. Do something yourself. Why rip other people off? Because it's cheap and easy. It's not their goal to do something original. They're not in for the art. Yeah. I know. So anyway, again, sorry for the rant, but please don't shop with those companies. I understand the price is tempting. I understand the price is low. It's 40 bucks, 50 bucks for a kilt. But don't do that. Go to a company who's not ripping other people off, who is taking pictures of their own designs, who does have an original name, um, and buy from true artisans who are actually making the stuff and not just trading on the name of somebody else. Yeah, and, and you do get what you pay for. I mean, a kilt that cheap is going to be crap. A sporn that cheap is going to be freaking cardboard. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Grr. All right. Uh, Sorry for the rant. Uh, Indeed. Emma. Okay. All right. Give me so, something positive. Give me a yeah, nice, so let's fun, have a fun happy one. question. A very fun. Uh, Jared Zimmer just got married at the end of September. Congratulations, Jerry. Jared. Sorry. Also tough. Uh, uh, he wants to know. Uh, he would like to get his wife a maxi kilt. Do you accessorize the same as a man's kilt, like a kilt pin, sporn, etc.? So, ladies' question. Sure. Maxi kilt. Um, Why don't you kick it off then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll start us off. How do you accessorize your maxi kilt? Yes. Emma? Um, yeah. So. Uh, and explain I, what a maxi kilt is for those who don't understand. It's one of our model names. Yeah. So the maxi kilt is one of our newer models. Uh, it was released earlier this year. 
Um, it differs from the a, a little bit older models of hostess skirt and kilted skirt. Um, in particular, it has more of a flare shape to it. Uh, it's also uh, constructed so it can withstand um, some of the heavier weight materials. So we do 12 ounce polyviscose in it, 13 ounce wool for maxi kilts. Um, and uh, it's it's got a little bit more fabric in it, which is really nice. Uh, and you get some uh, hefty, heftier straps like you'll see on a men's kilt rather than the thin ones on a kilted skirt. Um, so how I accessorize mine, um, I'll usually do a kilt pin, uh, just any kind of, sometimes I'll do non-traditional ones, but a lot of times I just use uh, the men's kilt pins, but they're for anyone. Um, and uh, I tend to stay away from sporins um, just because the sporins that we have, and we do have lady sporins, um, but I gravitate a little bit more towards the men's designs. I like the mm. brown leather in particular um, and some of the more intricate uh, sporins, but they are very, very large on me. Um, they would take up mm -hmm. a big chunk of the front of my kilt or the side of a kilt. Uh, if I did wear a sporin, I'd wear it a little bit off to the side. Um, so... For that reason, I tend to avoid uh, the sporins. Um, also, because I'm, I'm at my desk all day, I, I don't necessarily need one when I'm wearing my kilt. Um, but uh, definitely, there are some uh, ladies who do wear sporins, um, especially if you have the body shape to pull it off. Definitely, it's extra pockets. Who doesn't love an extra pocket? Um, and then, um, let's see, uh, belts. I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes do a belt. Sometimes I'll go without a belt. Um, Let's see, hose, men's men's outfits will have hose. I will sometimes wear hose. I like to wear hose when I wear tall boots. I'll cuff them over the top of the boots. Um, I typically don't wear flashes with mine, but uh, some ladies definitely do wear flashes. I had a lady in the store today. She looked fantastic with her hose and uh, matching tartan flashes to her Tara Murphy kilt. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, experimenting I would say she could do. Um, try out a few different things, see what you like. Uh, that would be my best suggestion. Now, when you wear a kilt pin, a maxi kilt, um, as we define it, is essentially below the knee. Um, when you wear a kilt pin on yours, do you wear it up like mid-thigh kind of thing, or do you wear it lower on the kilt? Yeah, uh, so when I'm wearing my maxi kilt, I kind of imagine if I was wearing a men's kilt where that men's kilt would end. Um, so I do wear it up on my thigh. If I wore it like all the way down at the bottom of the kilt, um, it's so low that it would I would be kicking it all day while I'm walking around. That gets super annoying. Um, so it's not moving as much when it's on the thigh and kind of stationary there. Um, so that's that's usually where I put mine. And what kind of top would you usually wear with it? Yeah, um, so uh, you can wear all different types of tops. I, I'll wear a t-shirt sometimes. Uh, I like a button up, a blouse I'll do a lot. <clears throat> Sweaters I'm big into as well. Uh, I like to layer a lot with my kilt, so I'll do like a tank top and then an overshirt uh, just to get some more color going and, and coordinate a little bit more. Uh, but there's a lot of versatility. Uh, I would say there's not too many shirts I wouldn't wear with a kilt, but, you know, <laughs> not, maybe. Not a plaid flannel shirt. I actually have oh. a solid color saffron okay. kilt that I wear my maple leaf tartan shirt with. So Which looked there. awesome. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I actually made sure we got a photo of that, so you guys will see that in edited version of this show. Aha. Uh -huh. Yep, because got to get those images. Indeed, indeed. So, kind of stole my thunder with some other questions we had written down here for you there, Emma and Rocky. So, I do want to thank... Uh, you know, Denise and Victoria and... and for, for putting their questions in and, and Andrew and... Well, how dare we have a rambling discussion where we discuss <laughs> different parts of a and woman's outfit. Right. Let me... Let me while let we me, have a woman on the show. Me, while we're talking about general ideas, guidelines for a woman's outfit, um, I will throw this one back in. Denise Thane had asked us, um, how do you balance looking professional in, a, in ladies' kilt outfits? For instance, and most importantly, how do you avoid it coming off as a sort of a schoolgirl effect? So this probably has to do more with tops and such so yeah. how do you make sure you don't have that you know school sexy schoolgirl <laughs> halloween <laughs> costume going vibe. on yes. yeah, 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 yeah the britney yeah. spears vibe yeah i i definitely feel you denise i run into this sometimes when i'm getting changed i'll put on a whole outfit and then look at myself in the mirror and realize i look like i'm on my way to catholic school and mm. then I back to the fitting room uh for that uh so 
Um, I would say that there are some some things you can do to avoid that. Um, number one, a big thing to think about is the length of the skirt uh, in combination with the top that you're wearing. Uh, I have several mini kilts. I tend to avoid wearing my mini kilts with like a button up or a white shirt mm. um, with a collar, something like that. It's very uniform very quickly. Um, and uh, I'll also kind of dress things up sometimes with, with tights underneath or leggings also can kind of help dull that effect. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would say just avoiding some things that look typical uniformish uh, would would help with that. Um, so you don't want to sit basically to avoid the waifu. Yeah, look. Yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that the leggings make sense to me because you can have a color there mm -hmm. and you can actually tone with a color or go with a neutral so that yeah. but you're definitely you're not you're you're I think the bare skin on the legs is definitely a problem yeah. for that. What about um what about when I think about the schoolgirl waifu thing, I think like, you know, the sailor top or the collared shirt with the the ribbon tie. White socks. Yeah, white socks. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I would definitely say um, if you're someone who is interested in wearing hose, kind of keep that in mind. Uh, you kind of mm -hmm. get those knee-high sock effect. Yeah. Uh, I, I find that wearing it with boots kind of dulls that. You don't get that as much. Um, but yeah, so shoe choice also you can factor it in. Um, but I would say that there's a lot of experimentation you can do with the outfit and give yourself a little bit of extra time if you get to the mirror and... You look like a schoolgirl. You look like Britney Spears. Get back into the the closet. You got to try something else on. Um, but yeah, I, I would say don't worry about it too too much. Avoid avoid those things that we talked about, and then you'll probably be pretty safe. I think a lot. I build it up in my head sometimes when I'm getting dressed. I'm like, oh, I look like a schoolgirl because you see the tartan skirts, and you think. Um, but I think more and more as more ladies start wearing it, we're kind of moving away from that, uh, which is. Positive. I think I think some of those looks are definitely fashionable right now too, especially with yeah. the younger people. Mm -hmm. um, all those crazy kids out there, um, that trend may dissipate. Mm -hmm. You know, but I mean, if if somebody wants to look like Britney Spears or look like they stepped out of an anime, okay, fine. But it's it's con it's context, and and what you're saying is exactly what we tell the guys. I mean, I'm, I'm a broken record with this, but if you're not sure about the outfit, you know, check yourself in the mirror, try things out at home, so you're sure. I think and and I and you you mentioned length, right? Yes. Yeah, because I think like Jillian wears a lot of um, outfits where the top is is that kind of shirt we're talking about, and she'll often use a ribbon tie, but she's using a longer length kilt or kilt skirt, so it she gets more of a dark academia vibe. If she wore the exact same top with a mini kilt, the overall impression would be very different. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would also say thinking about how you're accessorizing with it. When you're putting together a whole outfit, you kind of get a more sophisticated look to it when you're thinking about the colors and kind of combining everything together. Jillian is uh, dresses, I would say, like a maximalist. She always has a lot going mm -hmm. on, but it all coordinates. And it doesn't look like a uniform that someone just picked a white top and a mm -hmm. you know navy vest and a mini kilt on and, and looks very schoolgirl. Um, so yeah, kind of step up the outfit a little bit, I think also helps cut that out. Cool. Cool. Hope Thank that you. Helps. I have, I have, I have other questions for you, but we'll, we'll get to them in a little bit. Yes. What do we have from the interwebs out there? Alrighty. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's see. Dalton Parker. Oh, wait. Actually, pause before we go anymore. We have to do our... Our ambassador today is the one, the only, Sean Smith of Cleveland, Ohio. Sean holds degrees in Spanish and organizational psychology. For the past 20 years, his work has been in marketing, and currently he works in marketing automation development. Sean first wore a kilt way back in college, but he lost it. So fast forward to about 10 years ago, Sean and a group of six friends of his were going to the Cleveland Celtic Festival, where they stumbled across a kilt vendor. They all agreed to go in on kilts together. And as they say, the rest is history. Since then, Sean has become, as we say in the kilt biz, a peacock's peacock. He's wowed the community for years now with his exuberant style. Where does his inspiration come from? Well, Sean's an all-American mutt. But on the Celtic side, his great-great-grandfather came over from County Cork during the Gorta Moor. On his dad's side, he can boast descendants from the House of Canmore, as well as the McAlpins. 
Sean and his sister are the last of their immediate family line. Having no children, Sean has focused a great deal of attention on researching his heritage, which he says has been mostly forgotten in his family. His goal is to collect as many stories as possible to pass along to other branches of his family. And this led Sean to a really cool personal project, the creation of a personal family tartan. As he puts it, I named it In Memory of Trees. The colors represent the various nations and faiths that shaped our family's migrations. The design leads your eye from darkness into an intensely bright single stripe. My idea was to represent how even though the family line is ending with us, the family legacy will carry on through other branches. Sean's creative expression extends to accessories too. May we present for your viewing pleasure, the Peacock's Born. Not gonna lie, this is a bit intense even for me, but the concept is epic. The base is a hunting sporin. Each leaf is then etched with a different heraldic animal related to Sean's ancestors, many of whom came from noble families, as it happens. And the feathers? Well, that's sort of an inside joke between Sean and some of his serial kilter friends who he's nicknamed his pretty peacock family. So the sporin basically represents Sean's past family as well as his current found family. He says, Highland Dress provides a vehicle to share experiences and stories with so many other people across the globe. On a personal level, kilts remind me of my family's history and the responsibility to pass that on. Kilting is an incredible fashion statement. Who doesn't like looking like a Highland superhero? Sean is a true bon vivant and one of the prime movers of the kilted rabble rousers. In case you don't know, that's a friend group who basically met first on Kilt and Culture, our Facebook group. They organize regular meetups at pubs, festivals, and places of historic interest in their region. As Sean puts it, kilt wearing is best as a shared experience. So hey, if that sounds fun to you, Sean and the other rousers want you to know that you can do the same. Just connect with other kilted gents on the KNC group and find a place to go. Hosting a rouser meetup is also a great way for you to help kilt newbies in your area build confidence. Thanks for all the inspiration, Sean. Here's to Sean. Bunch of balls, Sean. You bastard. Uh, Sean's a great guy. It's he's he's, he's a sexy beast. That's what he is. He's from Ohio, and he's come out here multiple times. I love hanging mm -hmm. out with him when he mm -hmm. comes out. Mm -hmm. um, he's always an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's um I. Like I say, like I said in the video, I mean, some of the stuff he does is, for me, really over the top. But he pulls it off, you know. He he he's he he makes it work for him, and he's got heart and soul behind it, which I think is cool. I mean, that's kind of the goal for everybody. Yeah. So I do think that uh, it. Just to reiterate, I do think the rabble rouser thing is important because um, I was just downstairs in the store um, earlier this afternoon, and there was a guy in there who came out to visit us in person from like the Williamsport area, which for those who don't know is a very rural part of Pennsylvania. And he said, yeah, I just don't have a lot of occasions where I can really wear a kilt because, you know, it's a very conservative area and sometimes you get flack, you know, and it's like the police and the fire departments both love it. They're both into the kilts. They think it's awesome. But a lot of other people are just going, eh, what are you doing? So I pointed out that if you connect with people on the Facebook group, ours or another, but especially because we got the rabble rousers thing going, um, you can find like-minded people and people organize meetups so you can go out and be in the company of other kilted men and have a really good time. You know, like Sean, like Sean says, yeah, and, and like Sean says, you know, kilting is a, an even better experience when you're doing it with friends. So um, you might have to drive a little bit, but if you're looking for an excuse to wear a kilt, there are other people who are too, so go for it. Yeah, and they're genuine, genuinely fun, nice people. Yeah. So at least the ones that we know, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least all of you out there. Um, yes, indeed. Um, yeah. So no, it's go find other guys in kilts. Yeah. If Sean Smith's among them, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sean, it's it's yeah, it's it's fun time. Wear your and, sunglasses. Exactly. You might get blinded otherwise. <laughs> no, it's yeah. Go out, have fun. Cheers. Yep. Yay. Inspiration's <clears throat> cool. All right, so is it my turn or Emma's that turn? That was Emma. I cut her off. All okay. Right. Go, Emma. Hey. Okay. Go, um, Emma. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, so Dalton Parker on YouTube uh, asked, uh, for a first kilt, would you recommend a casual or a five-yard? I've never worn a kilt, 
but I, and I have wanted to for years, but I don't know where to start. So for people who don't know where to start in kilting. Sure. Um, you have to spend $1,000. Millions. <laughs> Mortgage your house. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the my my you know the, the advice I give to everybody in the store, generally speaking, is buy the best kilt you can afford. So you're not going to regret buying the better quality thing. But if you only you know if you have a budget, you know figure out what your budget is and walk in there and say, okay, here's what I can spend on the outfit, or here's what I can spend on the kilt. Kind of start there. Um, in a five yard wool kilt, you have wool options. So you have a lot more options than you do in thousands, just PV. Correct. Thousands of options. Um, but I would say, you know, kind of that's that's one you know thought process that I would you know, put in people's heads is start there. The other thing that I would maybe say is the only thing that would go against that is if you're not sure, if you've never worn a kilt before and you have no idea if you're gonna like it or not. Um, either, you know, hey, maybe you rent a kilt for the first time you wear it out in public just for fun as, hmm. a, as a low bar on cost or B, buy a slightly more economical model if you think, look, I'm only going to wear this for St. Patrick's Day or I'm only going to wear it for Tartan Day or I'm only going to wear it for this one event and I'm probably not going to wear it again or not going to wear it often. Then I could maybe justify saying, okay, fine, start with a more economical model. If you think... I, I've always wanted to wear this. I've never had the guts and I'm screwing up the courage to do it. And I, I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, you know, then, and if, especially if your significant other is supportive of you doing it, then I would say you're, you're a little safer spending a little bit more money. If you're just kind of like, I don't know, I'll try it once and see what happens. Then maybe go a little bit more budget friendly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thoughts? No, basically. Yeah. I think that, I think you, you summed it up. Very well, sir. Thank you, thank you. Well done, well done. Dude. Kudos. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, context is, is as always important. So if you're looking for a kilt that you want to beat up, like you're going to wear it to mud wrestling at the Ren Fair. I don't know. You know, you're going to go wrangle some horses or something like that. For or, all the historical mud wrestling yeah, events if you that want they host at Ren Fairs. Or if you want, well, I don't know. They're not historical. Um, or, you know, you want it for hiking or something, then you get the casual kilt. If you want it to be all purpose and easy to dress up as well as easy to dress down, then the wool kilt will serve you better. It is easier and acceptable for even almost the highest of formality occasions, formal occasions, if it's a wool kilt. So that'd be something to take into account. Um, but yeah, if you want it for very casual and you want to be very cautious, then there's nothing wrong with doing a casual kilt. Um, so insert... Rocky's advice here. I will usually advise people to prioritize their money in terms of, if you have a budget, think in terms of the biggest chunk going to the kilt, the second going to the sporin, and then the third to a belt and buckle. Okay. Um, yeah, and you can fudge around with that a little bit. I mean, there are economical sporins, and if you really love a belt buckle and you really have to have that belt buckle, then fine. But uh, the sporin is the single most important accessory. Hands down. You don't technically have to wear a belt with a kilt. You can wear something over it so you're not showing off oh, naked midriff. Um, ah! You know, so um, that's how I would think in terms of prioritizing your funds and uh, take your time. Yeah. You, I mean, you build an outfit over time. It, like you say, it's it's eating peanuts. Yeah. You know, you start with a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and you add to the outfit. The one thing that you don't have to replace or don't have to upgrade is the kilt so if you start with a five yard wool kilt and you get the you know the right tartan for you the one that you've been pining after either your family tartan or a, a specific one that means something to you then the kilt is the is the the centerpiece of the outfit and everything else is kind of built around that so if you do start off with a really really budget friendly sporin because you have let's say you have you know 500 bucks on the whole outfit great spend the bulk of that on the kilt and then just suffer with the lower quality sporn maybe a lower quality belt and buckle to get through and then if you find out you like it you find out you're wearing it you find out you want to add more things to it great then replace the sporn replace right. the belt and buckle right add the kilt hose add the flashes you mm -hmm. know do that kind of stuff after the fact um but it's cheaper and easier 
to replace a $50 sporn with a $150 sporn that it is to replace a $150 kilt with a $350 kilt. Yep, exactly, so. exactly. So that's that's my basic advice. Emma, is there anything you'd... Does that make sense compared to what you tell people in the store? Yeah, yeah, pretty much I would say the same thing. Uh, I... I think the wool versus PV options, if, if it's your first kilt and you really want to honor your family's heritage and you come from a smaller clan uh, that might we not, might not have in PV, save up a little bit. Like, take your time, look at the kilt and culture page, get inspiration while you're saving up, get excited about it, but uh, hold off and wait, and wait for the five yard if, if that's really important to you. Because I think that's a big deal for a lot of people, especially for your first kilt. <clears throat> yeah. I, the, the other way, I like the way you said that. The other way I'll kind of angle it as well is don't settle. If there's something you really want, you know, as long as it's not, you know, $2,000 versus $150. As long as it's, you know, reasonable price comparison, don't settle. You're not going to like it as much. You're always going to pine over the other thing. You're always going to be like, ah, I wish I would have done that. You know, don't, don't live life of regret and your choices of what you're going to get. If there's a sporin, I'll use sporins. If there's a sporin that's $100 and the one that's $140 and you really, really want the $140 one, save up an extra week. You know, get the one you want. Don't just get the one because it's in front of you. You know, take your time, get the right things for your outfit, for your tastes, and then move forward because you're going to have it forever. You don't want to regret the things that you own. You want to buy it once and you want to buy it right. Mm. As Aman Amarth says, do not live a life with regret. Indeed. Live a life without regret. Yes. You don't want to lie on your deathbed at age 78 going, oh, if only I bought the Viking Knotworks barn oh, and die. You don't want to croak having regretted never owning a particular spawn or tartan or whatever. Right. Indeed. Have fun. Because that's what Ask you're going to be about on your deathbed is a spawn you yep. didn't buy 40 years ago. Indeed. Okay. All right. Was that you or Emma? That was Emma. Okay. Then you. Me? Okay. I'm going to throw another one at Emma then. Um, beep, 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 beep. I think this one will be quicker. Uh, Brad Wilson said, uh, hey, my wife has a couple of mini kilts that she likes to wear to match my kilt. That sounds fun. I'm considering getting her a midi kilt. Is there anything I should be aware of on account of or be aware of or account for when ordering a MIDI as opposed to a mini. I mean, this is product centric, but it is important because we're getting a lot of inquiries about. Yeah, these, a, lot so. of, a lot of women are asking about products and, um, and have asked about products um, in so our little world, at least. I'll, so. I'll start by kind of defining it a little bit. Um, we're using our terminology. So mini, as, well, as we define it, is essentially above the knee, a little bit shorter. Um, a midi kilt, M-I-D-I, would be around the around the knee, and then a maxi is below the knee. So, and as far as construction-wise, what's the main difference? Just length. Um, you know, there it's the same model, just you know, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. So, Emma, I was gonna have Emma say that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah, they, they are the same product, just a little bit longer. Some it, That is a, a little bit of confusion sometimes. Uh, they're not constructed every any differently. I like to joke in the store that we have the mini, the midi, and the maxi, and the mid-D falls mid-knee. Um, a little bit okay. of a tongue twister. Okay. Okay. Uh, but yeah, um, I would just say when we're talking a midi kilt, uh, for most people, they're falling around mid-knee. Uh, it can go a little bit above the knee for some women, uh, a little bit below, depending on how tall you are. Uh, so take some time uh, when you're measuring for yourself for that length. Um, I usually, uh, when I'm measuring a woman in the store, I'll take her in front of like a full length mirror, mm -hmm. hold the tape measure up at the waist and kind of point to the different lengths on her and say, do you like it here? Do you like it a little bit better down here? Um, at, because I think around that kind of knee point can do a lot for different people's heights. Uh, I find that when it hits me mid-knee, uh, it's not as flattering as just a hair above the knee. I feel like I look a little bit shorter in that. So take some time to uh, look at the different lengths on yourself when you're measuring or helping her measure herself um, and go hmm. from there. Yeah. So so the area of your total silhouette that the kilt is covering is going to make a difference, is going to look different depending on your height. 
Yeah, I, yeah, okay. definitely. Proportionally, okay. um, keeping it in mind, uh, we talk about the towel trick uh, when you're measuring for a tilt. I was going to ask if you use that. Um, yeah, okay. you could uh, use the towel as well. You're just folding it for the length that you're thinking of, getting uh, an idea of how that looks on you um, and how it makes your legs look, how tall it makes you look, that kind of thing. Um, and I would avoid something that maybe makes you look a little bit shorter if, if that's what you're going for. What about comparing it to a skirt they already own? Is that good or bad advice? Um, I I don't think that's bad advice necessarily. I think the best measurements that you're going to get are going to be one that you're taking yourself. Um, if you have a skirt and you're like, I love the way this skirt falls on me, I'm going to put it on while I measure myself down, kind of get an idea for that. Uh, the one kind of uh, thing I would keep in mind uh, for mini kilts, especially uh, if you have a pencil skirt that you love and and you put it on and you measure yourself um, because they don't hug your body as much. The midi, mini, maxi line flare out a little bit more. Uh, you won't necessarily get as much coverage as you're feeling when you're wearing a tighter fitting mm. skirt. Okay. Uh, so keep that in mind. What I usually say is measure from the front. And then maybe try measuring from the back and seeing where 14 inches or whatever uh, you choose there, 16 inches, um, 20 inches falls on you. 14. 14, yeah, I mean. Okay. Back to the Britney Spears thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now, um, yeah. one question I have for you. The uh, When I'm uh, talking about guys and, you know, kind of the way that I, I view kilts, um, on guys is, you know, middle of the knee is a masculine look versus, you know, above the knee or below the knee is a little bit more feminine. Do you feel the same way where it's, you know, if you're essentially splitting the kneecap, that it looks a little bit more masculine and you tend to go a couple inches above or a couple inches below? Or um, no? I wouldn't say I see women in their midi kilts that are fitting them like midpoint and say that looks like super masculine. Um, I think a defining difference there is the waist point. Uh, a woman wearing a kilt at her high waist, uh, I think that immediately creates a more feminine silhouette because you're highlighting that that smaller part of your waist and it's flaring out from there. Um, so yeah, like a T-length, uh, there are skirts that, that fit women at mid-knee um, and I think uh, they're not necessarily more masculine, um, but I think a mid-knee fit reads more traditional kilt to me when I'm seeing like mm -hmm. I, I see yeah. the mid knee fit and I'm thinking she's trying to look uh, like she has a kilt, maybe match a partner, um, pipe band type things. They'll go to the mid knee. Um, so something along those lines. Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. connection my brain makes is mm -hmm. that it looks like a traditional kilt length, therefore, and it's in tartan and it's to the knee. Yeah. That's why I'm making the masculine connection. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more a little more gender neutral. Yeah, kind of a look. Yeah, then. I would definitely agree okay. with that. Interesting. Cool. cool. Hope that helps. All right. Okay. That one was you. Yes, sir. Miss Emma. All righty. Um, so uh, we've got a question from Sergio Guerrero on Facebook. He uh, hmm. says, love you guys. The question is, is it unheard of to add patches to your kilt? For example, he's thinking of adding a Texas state flag patch to his kilt. What do we think? Um, is it unheard of? No. Um, people have added patches or embellishments to kilts, you know, for a while. Um, there's, uh, you know, on our, for instance, on our casual kilt, we usually, we used to put, used to, don't I anymore, um, put a patch on the lower right corner, essentially where your kilt pin would sit. We still offer it as an option, but we don't all like automatically put it on them. Um, even for the off the rack ones. Um, I know the brand sport kilt puts a patch up at the top. I've seen Highland games athletes put patches on their kilts, um, either of sponsors or just, you know, fun stuff that they're involved in. I've seen like punk rock looking, yeah. you know, style kilts. And you have a guilty tilt kilt, you tilt kilt with it. Yeah. I have a patch kilt. Um, so yes, it can be done. Um, it is not traditional, but sure it can be done. It's a way to, you know, express yourself a little bit. Yeah. Um, it will limit in some cases you could say it's going to limit the places you want to wear the kilt. You're not going to wear that kilt to a wedding. I don't think, I mean, who the hell knows these days, right? But, uh, yeah, it's, you're, you're instantly saying this is a casual garment. So, I mean, we often say the beauty of a kilt is that you can dress it up or dress it down. Um, if it's a decent quality kilt, you can basically use it for a huge number of different varieties of occasions. So be aware that, you know, once you make this commitment, there is no going back. 
Um, but yeah, I think if it's if like especially if it's like a casual ish kilt or if it's like an older kilt that is now like your second choice kilt, like you don't use it for the best of times, you use it for kicking around in or something like that, then why the hell not? Have fun with it. I mean, I um, I and a few metalheads I know and a few punks I know will put patches on a kilt the way you put patches on a vest, you know, so your your battle gear. Um, and that can be a hell of a lot of fun. Um, and there are some vets uh, who will do the same thing. They will use like uh, an, a, a unit patch or something, um, or they might use like a collar dog as a kilt pin, things like that. So it's fun expression. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just it limits when and where you're going to potentially wear the garment. That's all. Yeah. The uh, I remember the yeah. – it just flashed into my mind when you said punks and metalheads. I'm like, oh, the the kilt that we have downstairs from uh, Scruffy, Scruffy from Dropkick Murphys yeah. in a shadow Scruffy box in our changing room. Um, his kilt had you know, a few patches down on the bottom. Um, yeah. It depends on how much of the tartan you want seen versus how much of the patches you want seen and how many patches you put on it. Uh, you know, one yeah. or two, you know, it's, it's, it's small, but you can definitely go... Mm -hmm. Crazy with it, just like patches on a jeans jacket. You can go, you know, a ton of patches or just, you know, one big batch back patch and one on the front. Yeah. So I, I, I think I think there's something there's extra gravitas to your patch um, if it's kind of team oriented. Like, OK, for instance, you said Texas, like if you had Texas blue bonnet tartan and you have a Texas flag patch on it, that's pretty badass because you're, you're in a theme there. Right. Um, if it's or if. Like in my case, the, my patch kilt is black. Or if you have like a, a shadow watch or shadow tartan black kilt or something like that, where you decide the patches are going to be the main point of attraction of the garment, then that can be cool. Um, if you have like a loud McLeod tartan kilt and you're putting a bunch of band patches on it, that's going to be quite the statement. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, think about the art you want it to be when yeah. you're done with the project. Ramble, Agreed. ramble, 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 shaggy dog. Indeed. Arp, arp. That wasn't too shaggy. No. That's fun. I need more patches on my patch kilt. I haven't put new patches on that thing in nigh on a coon's age. Speaking of states and tartans, Rocky. Mark Michaelis. Michaelis, as always, forgive me if I mispronounce. Mark. Uh, Mark. Hey, Mark. Uh, says, I know that Arizona, New Mexico, Washington, and several other states have registered tartans. <clears throat> Is there any chance that those can be added to your list of available tartans? Now, I, I'm trying not to make this company-centric. So what is the process uh, like if you want to get a state tartan? Sure. Let's answer it that um, way. Well, let's start off with not every state has tartan. True. It has a tartan. Um, some of them do. Some of them are official. Some of them aren't. Um, like they've been, you know, Hanukkah, Hanukkah blessed. Like I know Pennsylvania has a tartan and it was mm -hmm. officially adopted and, you know, blessed by the Pennsylvania state legislature. Um, it's the second best one. Yeah. There are, there are state, there are some state tartans that are officially adopted and or, or copyrighted. So Maine or Rhode Island or, you know, there are certain uh, state tartans that like are controlled by an entity or by mm -hmm. an individual and you can't really do anything with it. Um, really the, the reason you know, the tartans that we have on our website are all of the stock supported tartans from all the mills in the UK. So to get, to get it on our website, convince house of Edgar or La Karen to carry it. Stock we'll support. Carry it. Yeah. Stock supported, meaning I can call them up and be like, yo, I need four yards of California tartan. Send it to me. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Um, if, if it is stock supported, anyone can buy it at any time because the mill is taking the risk of holding the stock of that thing. If we, if if you got a, uh, if we decided, okay, well, we are going to take the risk of carrying California or Texas or whatever tartan, and you know, then we would have to buy a bolt of the cloth and you know sit on that as well as each individual you know state that has a tartan. Um, then that's a risk on us. If you as an individual want to do it and get a group together or want to have it custom woven specifically for you, you know, from one kilt up to you know, a whole group of you doing it, you can do that as well. So it's really who wants to, you know, roll the dice that you're going to, you know, recoup your money out of it in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. So that's really what it boils down to is in the tartan register, there are almost 10,000 tartans, like, you know, 8,000, 9,000 tartans at this point um, that exist and that are registered tartans. 
not all of them are woven because, you know, if you have the 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 BJ tartan for some random dude's dead dog, which actually is a tartan that it exists. It exists, yep. You're, you know, no one's going to buy it except for that one guy. So none of the mills are going to weave it because they're not going to be able to sell it. So it's about, you know, reaching critical mass and being have, able to have enough people want a particular design or perceived, you know, <laughs> enough people want a particular design that a mill or that a company or that a group of individuals can have it woven. Yeah. And some tartans are controlled in a different way. Like for instance, Texas Blue Bonnet, I think is controlled by the one. It's copyrighted. It's copyrighted. And then Scotland Forever in Texas, right. scotlandforever.net, I think is their website. Yeah. Um, Roxy, wonderful lady. If you reach out to them, tell them that Rocky Rager from USA Kilt sent you. Anyway, yeah, that one is copyrighted and they have the rights to actually weave that one and sell that one yeah. from the design holder. But uh, otherwise, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, um, most state tartans at some point started out as a passion project of somebody's. So it depends on how much mileage they got, how much traction they got with their people in their state. You know, if, if the legislature and everybody were like, this is freaking awesome, we gotta do this, then you, know, you might have more people who are interested and all that kind of stuff. And then you have other places like, you know, why do we need a tartan? What what's a tartan? You know, it's going to be more rare just by virtue of that. So, or if it, there's not a a high percentile of you know Scottish people right. with Scottish heritage in the state, right? Um, maybe they don't you know care about it as much. Yeah. Uh, or it's there's a lot of reasons why a state may or may not have it. There are some reasons why it may or may not be official. Um, there's some reasons why it could be copyrighted or not copyrighted. So it's. Yeah, it's a it's a sticky wicket, and each individual state has to make up their mind for themselves. Yep. So, if let's you do that together. I can use that thumbnail. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you get a group of people together, and a tartan does exist, and it's not copyrighted, as long as it's open to be woven, sure. You know, any any company, us included, can happily get it done for you. Um, see if there's a pipe band who'd be interested. If you're trying to get a lot of people involved, hunt around and see if there are bands in the area that that might be interested. Because that very often they're the ones who are most likely to be interested in something like that. Because local pride is is a big deal for them. So yeah, yeah, agreed. Are you Gill? Yes, Miss Emma. Alrighty. So um, Emerald Wolf from YouTube said, "Hey all, love the k kilt and products I get from you. Do you encourage customers to send in photos?" I have great pictures from the wedding and wanted to share with with you the products of your labor. Aw. Sure. No, anytime. Sure. Yeah, anytime, you know, customers want to send them photos, we're always, you know, happy to see them. We're happy to, you know, see how our kilts look out in the wild. And where I actually really like doing it um, is showing it to the actual kilt maker. Right. So if you, you know, with every kilt that we make, with every kilt we send out, we put a little care sheet in there. Um, and on that is the name of the kilt maker who actually made your kilt. So... You know, they're sitting up in the production room, sweating their butts off with the iron, steam irons on all day. Um, and they don't often get to see, you know, their kilts out in the wild or see their handiwork actually being enjoyed. So if you want, yes, please send us an email yeah. with a picture of the, you in your kilt. And we do share those with the kilt maker and say, hey, you know, Sophie, you know, here's John Smith wearing his Smith kilt. You did it. He loves it. You know, here's him smiling and happy about it. And that really does help make their day and help show them that what they're doing means something to to all of you people. Yay. Indeed. Yeah. Now you do run the risk of me using your photo <clears throat> for a project in the future. Just be aware of that. Yes. Um, but sure. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't want a little validation like that, right? Yeah. You know, thank you. That's very kind of you to offer, actually. So... Yay. Indeed. I haven't been to a good wedding in a long time. Nothing like a good wedding. Yeah. So I'm gonna have Emma do another one because that one was short. That was very short. Yes. Okay. Two minutes. All right. Um so uh potentially another short one. Um Ellie Eli Steele on Facebook says, What color hose do you think are going to match the Appalachian folklore tartan best? Not to bring it back to uh Jillian and I's tartan again. Um let's but I think show that's that tartan on question. screen. Cambot? So, Eric, what would you wear with the Appalachian? Bloody hell. Um, we talked about There's this. There's a lot of different There's colors. There's a lot of options. Um, yeah. I think some of the new two-tone hose could go very well with it. Maybe. I, I would, I would because it's so busy, 
Um, in a good way. I would probably you go a solid. Go a solid. Yeah, yeah. I would either, if it were me, I would either do ancient green, weathered brown. Um, I'm leaning towards the brown. Some of those colors, exactly. Maybe a charcoal to kind of pick up the speckled, you know, uh, nature of it. Yeah, I'm leaning towards uh, brown and then red flashes. Yeah, I think brown or and, yeah or uh, or garter ties. I'd prefer garter ties with this. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, yeah. So I think keep it earthy. Definitely keep it earthy. Indeed. What do you think, Emma? Yeah, um, I would I would say similarly. I think also having the threads here at the store, um, the gray uh, in the tartan, those silvery mist over the the mountains. Okay. It does go well with the gray that we have in the store here from our colored kilt hose line. I would probably go with that as well. Um, and then I'll, I know we talked about hose specifically, but um, this is going to be a great kilt to go hiking in. So hiking socks too. Mm -hmm. Keep those in mind. Uh, it's an okay. earthy color for those. Coordinate. Yeah. That kind of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Anything really earthy and pastel-y kind of, you know, yeah. good color for it. The... Good for hiding both dirt and blood, mm -hmm. this tartan. <laughs> Indeed. Comments are saying light gray or maybe a bronze slash copper, which is intriguing. I think, I think the chocolate bronze accessories will go very well. Oh yeah, with this, yeah. honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and some of the some of the more um, brown to tan to red tweeds will go excellently okay. with this one. Okay. So yeah, there are mm. three different tones of brown in this tartan, so yeah. you could get away with a lot of brown tweeds. And brown is sometimes yeah. a hard color to coordinate with if it, you're, it like, is. the tone is off. But you've got a lot in here to mm -hmm. work with. Yeah. I know you're you're looking forward to seeing somebody in a great kilt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I am cool. looking forward to seeing someone maybe in a great kilt, maybe on the Appalachian Trail, if there are any great kilt hikers out there. Oof that would be really cool. I know it's a specific re request. I'd like to but... see David Barr. <laughs> David Barr. I was about saying. It is full jacket, vest, and kilt our, on the Appalachian Our friend Trail. David Barr Hiking has, full suit. <laughs> has ordered, is, is in the process of ordering a yep. tartan suit in Appalachian folklore. God's love you, man. The man's He's, committed. He is, he should be committed perhaps, <laughs> but yes, he I is committed. I was gonna do that joke next, damn it. Yep, yep. Shout out, Robert Hughes also got a vest, a tartan vest to go wow. with his kilt. So yeah, so people are doing it. Nice. Gorgeous. Excited for that. Nice, cool. Nice. All right. All right. Mr. Eric. All right. What do we got next? I'd like to do this one for Emma. Uh, Runa has said, um, I'd like to get an Arisade or a great kilt. In my research, it seems Arisades or Arisich. I caught it myself. Arisich. Arisich. Arisich? Arisich. Arisich. My ear is itchy. Arisich. I got to remember. Okay. Um, I would like to buy an Arisich or a great kilt. In my research, it seems Arisiches were more of an overskirt than a mainstay piece and tended to be less material. I don't know if the less material relates to how one wore the Arasich or to the point that women are just more petite. Could a standard length Arasich be worn in the same manner as a man's great kilt and have the same look and practical benefits? Or is it not enough fabric? What is the dividing line, if there is one, between an Arasich and a Fillmore? Yeah. Emma. Yeah, okay. I'll yeah, start Emma. off on this one. Um, I don't have a lot of personal uh, experience with Arisich. Uh, I don't do a lot of Ren Faire stuff uh, yet. I'd like to get into it. Uh, I have worn one for a photo shoot here. Um, and I would say we do get questions from ladies uh, pretty often about this, um, asking if they want to pleat something up more so, like a men's great kilt. Do they need more fabric? Uh, and I would say the answer is yes, and it depends on your size. Um, so if, if you want to do a full pleating, I would opt maybe go towards more the men's um, great kilt page um, and, and select a, a yardage that'll be uh, fit with your waist and, and hip um, for that. Uh, I would also say maybe keep in mind uh, the men's great kilt. And I think the Arisades too. Um, we have 11 ounce, 16, 13, uh, and um, 12 ounce polyviscose if you want a polyviscose one. But if you're looking at wool, um, that is so much fabric when you have a great kilt wrapped around you. 16 mm -hmm. ounce wool. Uh, with an Arisade, when you only have one or two yards and you're just draping it over a skirt, I think you can get away with it. But um, 
when you have 16 ounce wool and you're pleating it up, uh, I can imagine it would get really, really heavy, especially if you have more of a petite frame or something like that. Now, the, the Aris Hitch, um, it's, it's just for everyone out there, Arasaid, E-A-R-A-S-A-I-D, um, in Gallic is Aris Hitch. We were corrected on that recently, and we are trying our very, very best to say it properly. Always appreciate that. Indeed. Um, it's just like a man's gray kilt. It's, or the Fila Moore, it's just a length of cloth. There's no sewing involved in the Aris Hitch or the Fila Moore. So really what it boils down to is, um, I would almost say get the maximum length of fabric you think you could need and then make it work. I'll channel my inner Tim Gunn, just make it work. Make it work. So it's, you know, if you're, if you're of the size where a two and a half yard Aris Hitch would work or a four yard great kilt, you know, you're, if you're going for the lowest common denominator or highest common denominator, you may have to get four yards and then wear that as a great kilt. And then if you want to wear it as an Aris Hitch, maybe just fold it over or fold it differently to be able to wear it differently, like double it mm. versus. I think, I think having the more fabric will make it more difficult to get it to behave like a traditional Aris over a full skirt um, and bodice. So um, I agree. I would go for, if you think you want to do both or something, or if you want to do wear, wear it as a great kilt so you can do all the different styles of doing it, then yeah, go for the greater yardage. You can always trim off excess yardage and turn it into something else. You can always make a pouch or a bag or a sash or something else um, or a poncho, I don't know, out of you know some extra yardage if you have it. Um, you can't do that. You can't add on as easily. So that makes sense. I think my question is, I know there are a few gals out there who are wearing um, tartan as the the at the waist skirted great great kilt style. Um, like, um, oh, what's her name? Jackie from Albanac. Yeah, but she, I'm thinking of somebody who wears them out in the world, not for a performance or at a Ren oh. fair. But so I don't know how many people you've encountered, Emma, who want to wear one that way wearing it as a skirt as opposed to wearing it and having it up over their shoulder or layered to go over their head mm -hmm. you know what i mean i mean you, you know like our, our people our guys who we know who are wearing them basically with just the tail it is it do you think there are women who want to do that more you know like in a mundane modern context or they just want it for fair or SCA um, or something like that. Yeah, I think in in the store, um, it's definitely been a little bit more Ren Faire focused. Okay. I think uh, I think women love the the idea of that hood. When we see it in the photo, they always talk about, oh, yeah. how can I get that hood? I want that hood. It looks awesome. Um, so I think that's a, a big draw of it, kind of being able to wear it up like with a hood. Um, I don't think, I haven't had a huge amount of requests for the, the full pleating like you would on a men's great kilt. Um, so I do think that that over the skirt uh, idea is, um, is is probably where most people, most women that I've talked to are for it, for Ren fairs and um, different things like okay. that. Okay, yeah. then yeah, you could go bigger, but you may find that less yardage will actually work better with the rest of your garb as an outer layer over layer, so. It's, it's one of those where it, you, there may not be a good answer to try to have one thing for all things. It may, it's neither fish nor fowl. Um, so either get a great kilt or get an Arasich or, you know, split the difference, maybe, maybe split the difference on material, have wider pleats on a great kilt and a little bit more fabric to fuss around with with, with an Arasich. I have a random other idea and I think I actually hate it, but I'll say it anyway. Um, what if they got, it depends on the tartan and the color of Velcro. Hear me out. What if they got a, like, let's say it's between a two and a half yard Arasich or a four yard great kilt. Uh -huh. What if they got a four yard great kilt, cut it to be two and a half, and then put Velcro and Velcro, and then you could, as a great kilt, you Velcro it back together and you have a little oh bit more fabric. God. And then if not, then you have a two and a half so yard So like zip off hiking pants. You exactly. can just zip off the, the bottom exactly. of your legs zip and turn them into shorts. Down. Yep. <laughs> I think no. I hate this idea, but no. Yeah. No. Yeah, I hate it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I hate it. Um, I don't know. There's more than one way to skin an Arasich. So 
you know, I think m with more, you'll be able to play more and experiment is the bottom line. Um, I don't think there's any strict guideline on how wide or how narrow your pleats have to be when you're wearing a great kilt. So I, I think that you can you can fudge things that way, too. And remember, so, yeah, era snitches. Get our stitches. <laughs> oh, good lord! I would. I had one more thought about yes. the era stitch. Mm. Um, the men's great kilt uh, you're wearing as a kilt, so in replacement of pants or a layer underneath, where a lady's era stitch you're typically wearing over, over a skirt. Yeah. So when we talk about splitting the difference, if you want it to wrap around yourself and you don't want to have anything underneath, you might end up wanting to opt for more fabric so you can get it fully Absolutely. around you. Um, because those those measurements that that you see, like the two yard, one yard, is really more equipped for something that's just totally. going over a yep. skirt. Yeah, it's basically it's like, it's one part overskirt, one part shawl. If you think about it, it's just a shawl and an overskirt connected because it's just one piece one piece of cloth. But yeah, you gotta have enough to go around and around. So yep. yeah, cool. Hope Good luck. Okay. Okay. All right. Who was that? You? That was me. All right. You. My you over turn, there. yeah. Uh, okay, um, so Eric Hutala on Facebook. Uh, <clears throat> silly question, but cleaning slash caring for kilt hose. Just normal machine wash or does it need special care uh, or does special care need to be taken? It depends on the hose um, and the, the fiber makeup of the hose. If they are cotton kilt hose, machine wash is fine. Um, if they are hand knit, you know, cable wool, uh, cable knit wool kilt hose, like it's literally like a, a, a cable knit sweater, um, just made into kilt hose. No hand wash those. So it's really, I would say, look at the care instructions on the packaging of the kilt hose. If you've thrown that out because you've had them for a while, um, then look up the manufacturer of the kilt hose, see what they say their care instructions should be. Um, for most kilt hose, I'd say machine wash delicate. Should be fine. I would if yeah. you're if you're concerned about it. The two things you don't want to do is maybe use cool versus warm or hot water. Um, and second, do not put them in the dryer. Just lay them out over the back of the sofa. Lay them out on a drying rack um, or a clothesline or something like that. Let them dry, air dry, not hot. You know, tumble dry in a dryer. Yeah. Um, I I have a pair of you know, handmade, hand knitted hose, which I wear very, very infrequently because they're hella hot. So I will use them in the winter. Um, those get hand washed. Um, everything else, I, I use a gentle cycle in the machine, cold water, cold, 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 um, lower, slower agitation and, uh, and lay them out to dry. Rapid changes in temperature is what's going to destroy them. And agitation. Yeah. And agitation yeah. will do it. So um, but, you know, if you got the patience, it's easy enough to hand wash, you know, tub of water, a little bit of laundry soap, squish, 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 rinse, done. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So. I may or may not know someone sitting in this very chair whose wife may have washed a pair of hand-knit kilt hose and made them, felted the hell out of them and destroyed them. And I had to give them away. Or uh -oh. he, he, he may have had to have given them away. You gave them away on behalf of that person. Yes. Because indeed. you're such good friends. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yep. So I'd say yes, be careful, check on the manufacturer. Cool. Pretty much. Yeah, one follow up. Uh, do you think they should be hung up to dry or can they go in the dryer? No, don't put them in the dryer. That's what I said. Do not put them in the dryer. Um, you no know, dryer. Basically have a, a clothesline or a railing in your house that's flat or whatever and just lay it over that and let them just hang dry. I or, or lay them flat on a towel <clears throat> on your bed. Now, um, so here's another tip for the, for the process. If you're going to hand wash them, Hand wash them in the tub, squish, 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 as he said. Um, and then take two towels or, you know, one towel and put the hose in a towel, lay it on the ground and walk on them. Try to get the towel to absorb as much water out of it. You don't want to mm. wring them out, which will stretch them, but you want to put pressure and kind of suck the water out of them, huh. then lay them flat. I'm not familiar with that technique. Yes. I learned something new every day. Yes, it is my kilt hose foo. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. There you go. <laughs> All right. Eric. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Um, not too much longer to go here. Um, Sean Smith 
I heard of that guy. Yeah, wants to know what our preference is while wearing kilts, striped shirts, check shirts, or tattersall. <laughs> would you wear a striped shirt with, with a kilt? I would, and then I would ask you to put me out of my misery. Um, the, no, I've, I've seen. He's, he's yanking your chain. Oh, I know bit, he is. But. I know he is. Um, he's busting my stones. Um, I've seen like a herringbone, you know, like pinstripe kind of like super, super subtle. Eh, maybe it could work. I still wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, if any kind of stripe that horizontal stripes, no, if it's a rugby shirt with big honking stripes going across, I wouldn't wear it with a kilt, a tartan kilt. Um, I would absolutely wear salad color shirts. I would absolutely wear tattersall shirts. Um, tattersall meaning like a checked or, you know, a, a an window check window pane kind of pattern on a shirt. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, those can look very, very smart with a kilt. Yes, it is traditional. Yes, it looks great. You, what would you wear? Yeah. Um, stripes. No, no, no stripes. Um, I don't personally care for Tattersall that much, but it is the safer bet by far. Of and a what pattern. Was, what yeah. was his other option? Striped check. Check shirts. Um, yeah, I don't think I do. I would wear like a, a check gingham? shirt. A gingham check? Yeah, it maybe. Could work. Maybe. Could. Yeah. Possibly. As long as it's a small, you know, a small check. I don't know. I, I think. Not I, ideal. Yeah, I don't think it's ideal. I, 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 I'm pretty boring. I would rather go with a solid color shirt but play with the color of the shirt than um, do any kind of pattern. I, I prefer to have the the tartan do the patterny thinking, patterny show off. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, and maybe a tie. I like to have a, I like to have a pattern with a tie. Like I will have, you know, sometimes I'll leave, I'll have like a, a, a club tie with the stripes or I will do a paisley tie. Um, that can be tricky, but it can be done. Um, and just let the, let the shirt fade into the background. That'd be my preference. Um, I don't really go for patterned dress shirts very often, personally. Yeah. You have to, it's, anytime you're going with a, when you're mixing two patterns, you have to make sure that they're not competing, that they're, they're fighting with each other. Um, one's, you know, outlandishly, you know, orange and the other one's, you know, black and gray. Like it's, you have to make sure that they blend well together and that they kind of tone well. So it takes a little bit more of a discerning eye. Um, so mm -hmm. I'd say, Try it and see if you like it. Don't be afraid to experiment a little bit. Um, but subtlety is your friend. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. There was a guy on uh, KNC, Culture Culture, uh, who was asking for input on a shirt he was thinking of wearing to a wedding he was going to. Okay. Red Paisley. And, or no, no, it wasn't a wedding. I'm sorry. It was for the holidays. It was for, for like, you know, Christmas, Hogmanay, whatever, Yuletide, um, for the holidays. So it was this bright red paisley shirt, but it was red on red. The paisley pattern was more in the Subtle. jacquard weave yeah, yeah. Than, than it wasn't like a colored paisley. Mm -hmm. And if it had been a colored paisley shirt, I would have been like, oh, no. No, 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 no. No, honey, don't do that. Um, but, but since it's monochrome and paisley, I and a few other people are like, yeah, you can probably get away with that, especially with something kind of slightly goofy, like a like for a holiday outfit, for a holiday party, you know, office Christmas party. You could probably get away with a paisley shirt with a kilt um, if it's monochrome. Um, but I would not recommend a paisley shirt with with like you know purple and green and yeah, man, you know, heck <laughs> I with that. Agreed, and I would say for for a holiday party, if it's red, okay, because you're on theme. But if it's anywhere else, I wouldn't necessarily wear a shirt that loud because pretty that is going to compete with the kilt. So even yeah. if you're wearing a loud McLeod kilt and it's bright yellow and black Ooh. with a red stripe, like, could it work color-wise? Yes. But you're making a statement, look at me, I'm a freaking traffic cone. Like, like <laughs> you're you're over the top and it's not necessarily in well, a good way. You know, you know, we a bunch of us said the same thing was... Um, Wear it with a black vest, wear it with an argyle vest or something, a dark colored vest, because then you give just a splash of yeah. the color, a splash of the paisley pattern, and you're toning it down that way. And I think that kind of goes with some of these shirt patterns we're talking about also. Um, if you're worried about the shirt being too much, regardless of what pattern is, consider a layer on top. Yeah. One guy said, you know, yeah, I'd wear a black vest and I'd, I'd make sure I wore a tie. And I was like, no, I wouldn't even wear a tie with a paisley, a red paisley shirt. 
and it'd just be weird. I would just let yeah. the let the shirt be its thing. But with any of these other patterns, yeah, you can you can tone down the pattern of a shirt by having layers on top, whether it's a, a solid color tie or a solid vest like tweed or an argyle or something. So, yeah, there's more than one way to do it. Agreed. But go cautiously. Sean is in the chat right now. Of course. Um, he is threatening, I guess is how I would put it, uh, to say that next time he visits, he's going to bring his shirts with me. Maybe show you guys how it's done. Yeah, show me how it's done, Sean. <laughs> Set up the barricades. Yeah. Reactivate the bear trap. I know we haven't had that set up in a while, but the Hybridian guard hippos. Indeed, Hibridian. we we may or may not have Mac with a sniper rifle, sitting in production, waiting for Sean <laughs> at the door. No, I know. I just, I just, I'm waiting. I'm trying to think of lines to to say when it was like, you know, the beacons are lit. Gondor calls for aid. You know. The beacons are lit. Gondor calls for aid. You know. My God, it's full of stars, or, you know, <laughs> don't look into the light. You know, Set I mean, phasers to stun. You walk yeah. <laughs> Set phasers to stun. <laughs> or, or late Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's beautiful. <laughs> ah! You know, I mean, yes, my face would melt. I think if I saw. Yeah, it. yeah. He's gonna bring in this Ark of the Covenant with his shirts in it. You know, it's like, what? So. Yeah. <laughs> It's like Pulp Fiction. He opens up the suitcase. Are we happy? No, good God, no. Close that. Put it away. <laughs> it just glows coming out of the suitcase. Patrick's going to have to do this huge montage of movie clips now, just about Sean's shirts. So, <laughs> Yes, indeed. Oh, my gosh. All right. Okay. Challenge accepted, Sean. No, no. Challenge, challenge, no. Shut down. I can use a laugh. All right. Sure. All right. Miss Emma. Uh, we'll throw the final one to you. Okay, alrighty. So um, from Bill Mark on YouTube, um, I bought a nice brown sporin, nice brown fur sporin from a vendor at a fair, but in sunlight or f fluorescent light, the fur gets a greenish hue. Can I remedy this? What might that be? Do a we have greenish any hue? Idea? Yeah, greenish hue. What color is the? It's a brown fur. Brown fur sporin. How is soft is the fur? What is the fur? I'm betting it's rabbit. How All excellent questions. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bet it's rabbit. Okay, well, let's do this. If you're still there in the chat, A, what is the fur? B, um, yeah, how much was the sporin? Um, and how well was it tanned? Yeah, how much do you pay and what kind of fur is it? Yeah. Come on. We need we need more data. I All cannot right. make bricks without straw. Well, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to stall a little bit. I think Give I know what the answer one. might be. I have no idea what the hell I the think he's. Is. I think he's SOL, frankly, but yeah, I think All I know. Right. Um, I guess we we touched on this a little bit earlier uh, about ladies' wear, um, but I know we had some questions about belts specifically, um, wearing belts with a midi, maxi, yeah. mini kilt, um, and uh, so maybe we we can talk a little bit about that because I know that there's a lot of people out there. Yeah, before questions. before somebody derailed my list of questions an hour ago, um, we had had. Uh, we had a couple of people asking about uh, belts, you know, and, and, you know, Andrew Cooper had asked us, do you, Emma, like to wear sporins? And then we had other people asking about belts. So I think leather accessories are definitely a concern. And uh, what do you think? Yeah. Is, is, should you wear a kilt belt with a kilt as a woman? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wear a kilt, uh, a belt quite frequently with my kilts. Um, the uh, the ladies' kilt models actually don't have belt loops on them, um, which some people find a concern. They like the belt loops. I actually find it a feature um, to the kilts. I like not having the kilt belts, the be belt loops, um, because the kilt, the belt, the belts that I wear uh, are a variety of different widths. Um, I have some that are uh, two and a half, maybe three inches thick, some real chunky ones. And I have some super thin ones that are maybe a half inch um, or less. Uh, so I like to have a, a diversity of, of the widths of belts. So the belt loops, I think, um, not being there. The belt is purely going to be decorative. Uh, the kilt should stay up on its own comfortably. Um, it's just adding some differentiation from that big wall of, of tartan that you have. Um, place to hang your chatelaine yes yeah if, if you if you're um, jillian jillian yep she's got her chatelaine that she puts uh she she wears that on a sporn strap actually 
Um, but uh, we also sometimes uh, ladies will come in the store and ask uh, if they should be wearing a men's belt, um, the thick like men's kilt belts that we have. Um, and I tend to steer ladies away from those because they are very, very thick. Um, and it's a stiffer leather. And uh, especially when you're wearing your kilt at your high waist, um, you have that thick, uh, that thick leather that is not conforming to your body. Uh, so you're kind of losing your waist sometimes. It's creating mm -hmm. a gapping effect around the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to wear a kilt belt, you also need a big honkin, very cool, but very large belt buckle, um, yep. which uh, can be uh, very dominant on someone with a smaller frame. Um, so they, they do look awesome, uh, but they don't necessarily lend, I would say, to uh, the female form as much. Uh, I would also say, imagining it, I've tried it on before. Uh, when we got those wal walnut belts in, I was like, oh, I want one of these so bad. They're so good. Uh, and I tried it on and uh, putting on the belt buckle and wearing my kilts at my high waist, that's the point where I bend. Uh, so bending over, I'm getting the, I had the friend rear go big or go home uh, with the <laughs> friend rear belt buckle. So I got all of those pointy things just in my my skin. It poked me all over because that's mm. where I bend. Ladies uh, will wear their kilts a little bit higher than men sometimes, wherever their natural waist is, if they're doing high waist or low waist. Um, so not where they're, wi they're widest necessarily. Mm -hmm. So you run into that. I think you'd run into that a little bit more mm -hmm. or something like that. Technically, men are supposed to wear their kilts at the true waist also. Mm -hmm. And I do know people who run into the same consternation with mm -hmm. a buckle like like ow okay. um and i've even had customers wear their smaller and i've suggested a smaller size buckle as much as they want the fenrir or something like that i'll say you know what you should probably go with this design it's smaller and on your frame it's going to look more proportionate however the curves of the female form and the thick leather of the belt yeah that's a really important point i think it does not tend to work so yeah. And the a, the, uh, a kilt belt being as as thick and as as stiff as it is, um, will sort of think of it as more as like a cylinder. So it'll fit around a gents frame. And guys typically are a little bit more cylindrical shaped, where yep. women have more curves. So if you think of a curve like this, and then you're putting a cylinder around the curve, there's going to be a gap at the top, and it's going to be hitting at the bottom. It's stand proud, yeah, it's as they stand say. Proud, mm -hmm. yeah, indeed. So uh, and and we do make the point for guys that a proper kilt that's fitted right should stay on you without a belt um so yeah it's it's always kind of a a visual accessory or a differentiation like i think that's a good point it's, it, it adds a point of differentiation between the bottom half and top half of your outfit so if you're wearing a belt what do you do then do you just any old-fashioned belt or do you or is there something you look for in a belt that works better with a kilt or yeah um so i when I'm buying kilts specifically, I'll, sometimes I'll go on Etsy and that kind of thing and look for a, a really unique looking belt. I have a cool asymmetric one that's rather thick. So if I'm looking for something that's going to be more of a statement uh, and larger, I'm looking for something that's a little bit more artisan. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'll get my, my thin belts and my jeans belts. I'll just find them at, at thrift stores, um, anything along those lines. And uh, I definitely match my leathers together. I know we already talked about that, but that is a big thing that I think about. I have black shoes, so I'm going to get some black belts, and then most of my shoes are brown. I'm a brown leathers person, um, so uh, I'll, I'll match that way. But yeah, there's there's a lot of leeway there, I would say. I know that I wouldn't say there's as many uh, hard rules uh, as there are for men when they're picking out a belt. Mm -hmm. um, you, I think you can get away with a little bit more, try some things out. You probably have some belts already in your wardrobe if you just got a kilt. Try those, see what you like. If you like the thicker ones on you, like the thinner ones, uh, figure out what works best. Would you say that the top edge, top hem of a uh, a woman's kilt or kilted skirt is thicker than skirts they already own? Is that something they should be prepared for or is it about the same? Um, I would say it is. It is pleated, so there is a little bit of thickness on there. What I run into sometimes also is that uh, the strap is kind of right at the waist there. So uh, a lot of times I'll be putting my belt over top of that strap, uh, which adds a little bit of bulk. So if you have one that's maybe really close to not fitting you, trying it uh, on with a kilt um, might be a little bit disappointing. Um, but mm. you just have to keep it in mind when you're shopping for belts um, and uh, pick something that might be a little bit bigger. Uh, I also think that if you're wearing belts, if you wear your jeans maybe a little bit lower uh, and you wear your kilt at your high waist, uh, for a lot of ladies, especially if you have a, more of an hourglass figure, 
those are some pretty different measurements. I think mine are like four yeah. or five inches different, my low waist to my high waist. So a belt that fits me at my low waist will is way too big at my high waist and, and vice versa. Um, so keeping that in mind too, when you're thinking you might need to get some belts specifically for your high-waisted kilts um, to set aside for those. Cool, okay. Um, did we get anything sporing. back from the sporing guy? Yes, update from Bill. Um, he Burning said, missive from the front. <laughs> yes, uh, so he said he thinks it is rabbit fur. Yeah. Um, however, he paid about $50 for it at yeah. the Ren Fair, so. Okay. Um, it's a cheap sporn. Um, you don't know, if you don't know where it was, I, I'm guessing it was a cheap sporn, as, as cheap as in not artisanally tanned by a local guy. Um, it was probably, you know, mass produced, just, you know, whatever. Um, so either something in the tanning process or a, a residue of a chemical as part of the tanning the process. Dye. I think it's part the of dye. the dye that was used, how the dye was taken by the fur. Um, yep. Yeah, what could he, what can he do about it? I don't. If anything. I don't think there's anything he can really do about it. However, I will say that if they've done rabbit, rabbit is very affordable. We'll put it that way. And uh, very flexible. And it is dyed. It can be dyed all manner of different colors. So I'm not surprised if you think it's rabbit. Um, and again, the price is a dead giveaway. So I would say it's likely that something about the dye they used it might be something about a coating they put on it afterwards, a protective coating, which means that you might have a little luck by giving it a very, very gentle washing. You know, like a tiny little bit of soap and just just gently washing it, you know, like you would your dog. But, you know, I don't know. So to see if you can remove that, if it's a protective layer. Um, but I don't know if it's worth trying to do that. I would say rather... It is what it is, and you can't beat the price, so maybe it's going to become your secondary sporn faster than you think. If you love the color, I can't blame you for loving the color. You know, good browns can be, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, I will say that probably you notice it more than other people do. So it may not be a problem that you need to even address um, in that sense. If it bugs you, it bugs you. But odds are you are more sensitive to it than most of the people who are going to be looking at you. So, yeah, that would be my advice. Unless it looks like a green lizard on your crotch, mm -hmm. I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, we can give ideas of trying to over dye it or trying to wash it or whatever. The problem is, yeah. there's there's a reasonable chance you're going to ruin it. Right. And if it is a cheap sporin with cheap leather, you may uh, you may end up if you try to wash it um, ruining yeah. the leather. Yeah. Um, so and I rabbit would, sheds. Yes, and yes, 100% rabbit sheds, especially if it's not tanned properly yeah so either a wear it indoors where you're not going to see the green sheen to it no it's outdoors when um, he doesn't it's fluorescent light he said no i thought he said he's outdoors he sees it um, okay both we're both right here okay okay outdoors and fluorescent light so on your ninja wear missions, it in the dark yeah yes. we're in the dark <laughs> um yeah um and either either a ask your significant other or ask other people like does this look weird to you and if they're like no it looks fine then don't worry about it um and Hey, holidays are coming up. Ask for a better sporn. Ask for a gift certificate to, you know, to a sporn maker, to a kill company, something like that, where, and again, us or not us, I'm not saying you have to, but, right. you know, have your, you know, family help you to get one that you're going to like better or that is a, you know, a better quality one than the one that you have, especially if you're going to be wearing it more often. I sympathize. I've definitely been there. Yeah, I do. Here's my answer. Um, get some micro electric clippers and give it a hip hop haircut. Do you like zigzags or, or have your initials, you know, Wu Tang carved into the front of the sporn? Indeed. That's Wu -Tang what I would clan. do. Make it art. This green sporn ain't nothing to F with. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, yeah, is it green already? Just carve a dollar sign into it. You know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Cream. <laughs> Cash rules everything around me. Green sporns. Hold my money. Dollar dollar bill, y'all. Green, get the money. <laughs> Indeed, I, but I, I do sympathize. But this is this is a typical issue that guys will run into buying stuff at rent fairs. So, yeah, good luck. Cool. Cheers. All right, boys and girls. Question of the day. Mm. Question of the day for the ladies. Um, what is the the piece 
that you want to see us carry, tartan otherwise. What accessory, you know, okay. within within the realm of you know Celtic Scottish Irish stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what's an accessory either that we carry that you love, or something that we don't carry that you'd like to see us carry? Let us know in the comments. Cool. Thank you very much for tuning in, boys and girls. Until next time. Sanjaba. Sanjaba. Emma, how did you feel about your first time on Kilt and Culture? It was awesome. So much fun. You're right here. If you want to catch more of Emma's amazing talent, check out USA Kilt and Kilt and Culture content on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, and all those other social networks that they haven't even invented yet.